thank you all so much for coming tonight um, to our Cookies and Climate event. Um, I'm Karina Greeter, if I haven't met you yet, nice to meet you. Um, I work for Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission, along with my two colleagues here, Abby Sherwin, who's in the back, and then Julia Maine, who's in the back back. Um, we are the Sustainability and Resilience Program at SMPDC, that's what we call our organization. Um, and we're putting on this event tonight with the town of Berwick um, to have a friendly and open conversation about a serious issue, which is climate change. Um, but our uh, goal is just to hear your thoughts and ideas, share with you some things we know about climate change, and just get the conversation started about what the community might be able to do about it. Um, so I would like to give James, the town manager, sure. a second to say something if he'd like. Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, I think one of the exciting parts about this program, and either for tonight and ongoing, is just the opportunities the town has. There's literally, there's probably dozens upon dozens of things our community can do to be more resilient to the changing weather we're seeing. Ten years ago, we saw 100 year floods in back to back years. We're seeing droughts and it's causing issues for our, our infrastructure but there's other projects if we want an EV charging station we can go get a grant for it and, and build one uh, there's if we want to expand community gardens or support local agriculture that's also part of this program so what I'd like to see is what the community is interested in and we can go out and do it thanks great thank you Okay, so um, I have slides, but this isn't really a presentation heavy event. It's more of a conversation between all of us about what your experiences are and what's important to you and your community. Um, so the slides are just sort of to add some nice photos like this very old photo of Sullivan Square. So before we dive into just, you know, specifics about climate change, I wanted to have us all have a conversation just about what changes are you noticing in your community? Whether that's related to the weather or climate or just your community in general, what are you noticing um, in your environment, in your home, at your farms, um, in your businesses or your house? So um, with that, I kind of this is, didn't warn you guys about this on the video, but um, if you could turn to a neighbor or a couple of your neighbors and just talk for a few minutes about the changes you're seeing, um, you guys do that and then we'll all come back together again and sort of share what we're hearing. Do you want to talk with me about what you're experiencing? Yeah. Ernie. Karina, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm new to Berwick, but uh -huh. I, uh, I also lived in South Berwick uh -huh. for 40 years. I loved all the good conversations people were having, but I was having my conversation with Ernie, so I couldn't really hear what other people were talking about. Um, so does anyone want to share the, the impacts or things, their changes they've noticed in their life to the whole group quickly? If you just shout out a word or a phrase. There, there are more of us than there used to be. Do you mean in Berwick or yes. just in general? Well, both. Mm -hmm. in, in Berwick in particular. Yeah, your population is growing. Mm -hmm. We've noticed more traffic on our road, oh, primary yeah. other road than there were, um, you know, a few years ago. I okay. Think, okay. Because of the increased population. But, um, you know, that's a concern. All yeah, the, for sure. Did any of the other groups notice that too? The population, the traffic. I can say yes. <laughs> yeah. What about your group? Do you guys talk about something? We're talking about just noticing a difference in insects and just mysteriously trees and, and bushes dying and some of the invade. I guess some of the invasives we got uh, into. Yeah. I mean, there's there's definitely a decrease in insect population, mm -hmm. and I see it very clearly where I live, and I see it here at the library too. Because mm -hmm. yeah. when we have an insect, they know I don't kill them, <laughs> and so they call me to bring it outside, and we don't do that much anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, think about 
how many spiders mm -hmm. you've had in your house, how many flies have you had. You know, we did talk about bees and wasps downtown when we were trying to do the, the yeah. concert series. Based probably, I think from the, the drought, I think it was probably state or region-wide, there was a huge influx in wasps. Oh, interesting. Huh. Where I live in Waterboro, they had a wasp infestation at their park this summer. Is that what you guys had too? We had it at yeah. Memorial Field there everywhere, and during our concert series, they... Yeah, they had to cancel it. Was, yeah. Wow. Interesting. Any other impacts folks want to bring up? Um, you mentioned the drought. Were there other... Is that... Uh, well, we, we've seen issues with our public water system based off of the drought, and... It's, it's, I think it's cropped up, but it's been pretty, I mean, I think historically bad. It was about six years ago when we had some of the severe, severe droughts. So it's, it seemed like every other year we're in a severe drought. Where I'm not, I'm not sure historically what the droughts have been in this area. The increase in temperature, too. Mm -hmm. So many 90 plus days this year. In the year. summer, yeah. And mm -hmm. humid. Longer right through October. Right. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm, co you know, here, there's the fine line you walk. Oh, I love this weather. <laughs> oh, it's climate change. Oh. I definitely felt that this November a little bit. Yeah. Those 60 yeah. degree days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, go ahead. Uh, I was sharing with Karina that uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that people are more aware. They may not be ready to do or not know what to do, but they're aware. Um, I think I'm old enough to remember uh, as a kid watching the 1947 fire that swept through uh, and ended up in York County and right to the ocean. And it was devastating. And people, you know, uh, mourned their losses, so to speak, but it wasn't, they didn't make some connections. I think people are making more connections now. Uh, education has, has uh, helped that. For sure, yeah. Um, James, was there another point you were going to make? Or? I forgot what I was gonna say. That's okay. <laughs> um, any other impacts people are noticing or things they're, when they hear other people talking, that thinks, makes them think of something? We were talking a bit about the use of wood burning. Um, and the pollution that that puts into our atmosphere. Um, and yet we're in Maine and, you know, there it is, the wood all around us. Um, and what can be done, what should be done to uh, diminish that in some way or substitute it. Um. Mm -hmm. Yeah, heating fuels is a really difficult challenge to deal with when so many of us heat with fossil fuels. Sure. They're so expensive right now. Definitely the energy crisis right now is a concern for me. <laughs> um, and how do you balance that with using more electricity? Um, those are all really great examples. And, you know, to some extent, um, you know, whether those things are caused by climate change or just exacerbated by climate change, the fact is, is that climate change is influencing all the aspects in our community um, and in our daily lives. And um, so this is the point where we would normally give you a presentation about climate change impacts and why they're important. But we're going to try something a little different tonight, which is to use a short video. Um, this video was produced by the Maine Climate Council. Um, to talk about climate change in Maine and why it's important to think about it. So I'm going to put that video on and let it do the talking because it does much better than me in my PowerPoint slides. Um, so bear with me while I pull that up here. And hopefully the volume will be nice and loud. If you haven't felt the effects of climate change, you will. It's changing entire planet, Earth. We live in a tiny place called Maine. The natural resources that we have are what make Maine, Maine. We live off it, we're fishermen, we're farmers, we're foresters. Who doesn't want to have a job where you can see this every day? A lot of people see climate change as like, oh, this is, you know, a problem for the next generation. 
it is not a problem of tomorrow, it is a problem of today. It has the impact of changing life as we know it. When I was a kid, this might have happened once every 10 years. Now you can pretty much count on it happening every year. We're seeing water on, on sections of roads that we hadn't seen before. Drought, erratic frost dates, more extreme storms. The ski season's changing, ice fishing season's changing. All those things are changing right now. The thing about climate change is that it is directly threatening the things that we love about Maine. When I was a little kid and I would go out lobstering with my dad, he would just nail in lobsters, hard. I have traps I can show you that have stuff growing on them that I've never seen before. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. Climate change isn't just something that happens on the coast. This is not just about sea level rise. This is about, in our case, not enough water. There's like two moose out here. Moose can have between 30 to 90,000 ticks on them. When we recover that animal, it's lost 30% of its body weight and it's dead. And that's because of the impact of winter tech. In Maine, transportation emissions are 54% of overall state emissions. We've always had really strong farming and forestry and fishing industries. In order for those industries to continue to thrive, we need to focus on climate change now. We're writing a history right now for Maine that we will be ready. We're gonna be a state Leading. It's really important for climate change not to be seen as something that we have to pay for. It's also an opportunity for us to participate in the economy in a new way. There's 1.3 million people in the state of Maine. There's only 6% of us that benefit from heat pumps. Maine is setting an example for other states to set bold climate goals. Buildings have to save energy to address climate change. When we're up at full production, we're employing more than 100 people. Those are 100 good paying jobs in a community that is a couple thousand people. That has a multiplier effect that is massive. This is one of the first community solar farms built in Rumford. Having a solar farm or wind power are going to allow us to increase our tax base and we're going to keep that money here at home where it belongs. Framing the climate crisis as a social issue rather than a scientific issue, especially for younger folks, is critical. This feels like a team project where we all need to contribute. I felt like this was one way that I could make a difference. We hope we can do something about it. The next 10 years are really important. What Maine Won't Wait is trying to do is to say, here's what you can do about this. And by the way, they're going to help save you money. We're just trying to find common sense ways to help people take action. We are seeing businesses and towns follow the governor's lead. They're not waiting, and that's exciting. If we want to continue to have the state that we all love and cherish so much, we need to act now. Maine cannot wait. Okay, so thanks for watching the video. Um, I think it just does a great job of going very quickly through all the different impacts that um, Maine is experiencing and also why they matter and what we can do about it. So um, did, while you guys were watching it, did you notice any of the impacts that were talked about in the movie that were also things that you guys just talked about? A few things like the drought. Um, the invasives, that's kind of what the guy who was ta lo talking about his traps was saying, you know, invasives in the Gulf of Maine, changes in insect populations, you know, you're talking about decreases in insects, but they're talking about ticks, which well, is definitely a big issue, yeah. Well, that's because warming winters, mm -hmm. so we did talk about Yeah. Um, were there any other things that stood out to you guys in that video? Or that surprised you or shocked you? Big problems. <laughs> but, um, so there's always a compromise. And when I see it, I look at the wind turbines. And now that that's wind energy is, all, is much cleaner and all, but how is it affecting migratory birds? Mm. What are we doing to their patterns? You know, it, are there studies that go along with the solutions mm -hmm. that don't create bigger and 
Yeah, I think that's something that's talked about a lot, you know, especially with right now in Maine, a big thing is the solar farm development. Like, yes. how do you balance the solar farms with the agricultural, you know, or the use of the, yeah, exactly. So there is a lot of work being done on that, but you're, you're exactly right that it's sort of, how do we move both of those things forward at the same time? And I think that's part of the action is like you both have the people who are accelerating the technology and the community groups and the research organizations that are doing the research at the same time and those two groups need to work together which I feel like is happening in the state right now especially with the solar development. I think that the solar farm and developments are finding there's pushback mm -hmm. in communities and that's why they're slowing down. I don't think that they're let's research this because it doesn't behoove them to find out why things shouldn't be in a certain place or so big. Mm -hmm. Well, CMP also has a two-year connection backlog because they were busy doing other things the past two years instead of working on getting our new solar developments connected. So That slows things down for sure, yeah. yeah. Which, you know, we can't talk to the PUC. Everybody's allowed to make comments to the PUC to tell them that CMP's up to it. But, um, yeah, I think, because we were kind of this, this point was brought up here, uh, engaging rural communities um, in such a way that they don't feel like they're being, because we know Mainers love feeling like they're being told what to do, um, <laughs> and and feeling like their, their relationship to the landscape isn't being challenged. Like, I would love to hear more about how S, SMPDC, I think I got the right, mm -hmm. um, approaches sort of that conversation. Of how the conversation of like ensuring that your community and how you view it isn't um, being forced upon by this message of climate change. Yeah, and, and, and especially about it, considering yeah. that these communities are also, you know, in terms of what's changing, like a lot of physically, like a lot of land's getting paid over. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people from away coming. There are like all these things that can kind of create insecurity in communities. Um, and so, how do we make the clean energy transition not be one of those things? Right. I think it's just a reframing of it to an extent, and that's a lot of something that we talk about and have been talking about in this process of SMPDC is relating um, climate action to your community's core values of and part of why we're here tonight talking to you all and what your concerns are is because um, the core values in one community might be natural resources and then to an extent then your conversation about climate change is about well how do you ensure that those natural resources and those ecosystems you care about are resilient in the face of climate change that's happening some folks are concerned about development and so it's you know the development pressure is happening so how do we use make sure that that development is directed in a way that benefits the community and also is in a positive direction when addressing the climate crisis you know that's really in a way you're not necessarily doing things just to address climate change it's that you're doing things anyways and addressing climate change and that will make your community better in the future either way um, so that's sort of how we try to frame it but again you know it's it's great as Berwick as a rural community if there's feedback on that message we would love to hear it too but we it's really a different from community community like you know oh, solar's great in this community, like in Rumford, you know, they're really into solar, even though they would say they also really care about their forestry and their industry, but they're coming at it from an economic development um, in their community that has, you know, they had a mill close and economic development is the most important thing to them. So it's really connecting on what's most important. Any other takeaways from the video at all? Or um, the next thing we can start talking about is what Berwick is already doing that already happens to address climate change as well, whether you guys were focusing on that or not. All right, then we will move on to that. Okay, so <coughs> this is now the PowerPoint presentation of the evening, which is um, <coughs> an overview of some things that Berwick is already doing that addresses climate change. Um, the first of these is this tonight. Um, this workshop is part of Berwick's efforts to enroll in a program called the Community Resilience Partnership. This is a program that has been developed by the state 
to assist communities like Berwick um, and all communities all across Maine with taking actions on climate change. The main way that this program does that is by providing direct grants to communities to do whatever the community's priority actions are related to climate change um, and also provides us, SMPDC, and other service providers the ability to assist you guys in identifying what those priority actions are and applying for that funding and scoping out projects. Um, in addition, the, the partnership has a, a higher level action of providing regional coordination, connecting communities like Berwick to your surrounding communities that are also participating like Elliott or even ones far away like Freiburg or Rumford. Um, about some potential multimodal collaboration and then also sharing of experiences. What projects have worked well in other communities? Like a big one is composting programs. Communities are always trying to figure out how other towns in Maine have made composting programs work and that's a role this organization can play in that. And then the last uh, point is that the state has really prioritized this community resilience partnership as a way to help communities address climate change as part of their climate change efforts at the state level. So for other state-run grant programs, communities that are in this partnership get a little extra boost. They might have lower match funds they have to pay or priority in the application process. So um, the town of Berwick has started enrolling in this partnership. This workshop is part of that process. And then after this, we'll be able to submit the enrollment materials. Um, but this is really you know, an action the community is taking to start thinking about climate change priorities in the community. And the town was awarded a $1.4 million project through the DOT infrastructure adaptation grant. So that's great. It's a lot more. There's a lot more resources out there. Mm -hmm. um, so, speaking of transportation, <laughs> um, Berwick is already doing a lot of work to address transportation issues like those you brought up, which are also climate change issues. You know, more cars on the road mean more fossil fuel burned in cars, gasoline, diesel, and more greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants um, in the air. And so uh, a lot of work that Berwick's been doing, and I don't know if this, that grant was part of it. Is that more for the drinking water? Or? It's not for, it was, it's for a, a stormwater project. The stormwater project. Yeah, so um, a lot of the work that Berwick is doing on transportation is through the partnership with the shipyard, as well as the other regional communities like Kittery and South Berwick, um, where they have a lot of funding from the federal government to do a lot of transportation work um, because many folks commute from Berwick and the other communities to the shipyard and Kittery. Um, and so figuring out the transportation and congestion with that is a big priority. Um, so right now that project is looking at micro transit service design. So like, you know, how do we get people places with transit that's not big buses, but smaller? Um, and also multimodal hub design projects, which is like, how do you design a transportation hub that's not just for buses, but for people doing um, ride shares, for people biking, for people walking? How is that hub serving all types of transportation? Um, so those are some projects. Are there any others that are worth mentioning about transportation? Just to close the loop on the micro transit, mm -hmm. Great Falls Construction is very interested in incorporating some sort of bus stop, possibly a shelter. Um, and I think through the joint land use study to the shipyard, just opening up bus routes, connecting up through up to Sanford and beyond and Pratt & Whitney and just making busing more convenient um, and more viable. Is, I think we're going to see a lot happen over the next five or ten years. Yeah, that's great. Especially Jeez. as... Is most of that related to getting people to and from work or to other things as well? I think it starts with specifically figuring out how to get people to the shipyard but my my opinion is if we can figure that out it opens up other opportunities so if we have a bus line that can get to the shipyard why wouldn't we have a bus line that can get people to downtown portsmouth that's my thought on it you know what i mean yeah because you know part of my question is if if it's heavily to getting people to work then you've got all of these vehicles spending three quarters of the day doing nothing. Um, you know, and, and maybe something like Berwick for a lifetime, 
there might be a way to, to use those vehicles in the non-commuting hours to get people to doctor's appointments or to shopping, you know, or to where, you know, to the beach, wherever they want to go. And then, of course, the last question is, where are we going to get all these bus drivers from? <laughs> that's, a, that's an issue. It is an issue. Yeah. Are there, um, I guess I was listening to a story on the radio recently about how in parts of the country people are actually just sending kids straight out of high school to learn to become truck drivers because of the mm. national like, truck driver solution problem, which like is mildly terrifying but also might work <laughs> in s certain you know scenarios. And so I'm wondering if there are, you know, I know some of the solar companies and things such have like training programs mm -hmm. for people. like. It, is there marketing to, like, or educational outreach uh, to, like, Berwick schools by these companies that, you know, are in the sustainability sphere? That's a good question, and I don't know the answer. I know that in terms of, like, um, like HVAC and EV, uh, like, maintenance, those are two areas where I know the state has developed this program called the Clean Energy Partnership which w is a starting workforce development that is going to target high schoolers. Um, they just launched it like this summer, so I don't know of any actual things that have happened with it yet. Um, but you know, I don't know if they're targeting bus drivers, and that's a really good idea, especially with now folks are getting uh, electric buses. You know, Wells Lagunquit School District just got uh, rebates to get 11 electric school buses. And not only is who gonna drive those, but driving those is really different than driving a normal bus. And they, yeah, folks usually have to undergo specific training to be able to drive it because it's sort of like a one pedal driving system with the automatic braking that the trucks do, the buses do. So that's a really great point. I'll have to look into it. All right, so transportation is one area. The other one, which many of you are familiar with, is development, um, specifically the redevelopment happening downtown in Berwick. Um, so a lot of this has been uh, focused on you know, revitalization and brownfields remediation, but there's also things happening in this, the redevelopment of the downtown in Berwick that is helpful for climate change issues. You know, the fact that it's going to be denser development that folks will be able to um, live and work in smaller communities so they don't have to drive as much on rural roads is good. Um, and um, that also, as part of the JLUS, you guys have been doing some regional housing and transportation analysis as well. And so there could be potential other ways to look at land use and development to try and encourage folks to be able to live and work in their communities like Berwick. Um, anything else to add on that one? Just, I think region-wide, as the da our downtowns become more dense and just public transportation become more viable, there's just a lot of potential there. Yeah. And just, I think from a regional perspective, just educating why dense development is so sustainable. Mm -hmm. And housing isn't a bad thing. I mean, I think... I think the tide might be turning a little bit on, on housing as now, I mean, there's been a housing crisis for 10 years, but until it becomes real, when you're trying to look for an apartment, it's not, you know, you don't really see it as a housing crisis until it affects, affects you. Um, but I think there's definitely a pushback on housing, but it's important to have dense development so you can have walkable communities and not need to depend on cars. So I have one question. Maybe two. What's happening with senior housing? Seeing as we are the great, greatest state in mm -hmm. the union, and what is in the comprehensive plan for Berwick for our elders? We, I mean, Specifically, there's no um, subsidized senior housing that's on the horizon. Uh, it could be something that could be made a priority. That's something that we probably talk with EJ at SMPDC to try to figure out. Or I know with economic development, we've been successful at targeting people to come to town. If 
there's a site that's identified, you know, we could target somebody to say, hey, please bring your senior housing development. It's, that's, it's doable. Yeah, because, you know, like climate change, we're all moving in one direction. <laughs> so it's not backwards. Keep it in mind. The other thing I always question, because we've talked about with the Envision Berwick um, and keeping on track, is there any thought of bike lanes? If we want to get people out of cars, can we have sidewalks? So, the, so coming across the the bridge, there will be a bike lane. There will be actually two bike lanes coming across the bridge and going up School Street. That will be constructed in 2024. The bike lane will end. Uh, the whole project ends right around with the old fire station. So it'll go from the Summersworthburg Bridge down that stretch of Sawmill Hill and up School Street. So there'll be two bike lanes. So bike lanes on either side. Could we get it to come up to the library? Just to. <laughs> <laughs> and how about a sidewalk? I think it, yeah, I mean. Here's the problem. Okay. Um, the problem is stormwater and drainage. The more you pave, the less drainage you have. So there are places where it makes sense. Right around here, you've got a lot of kids, so you want for safety purposes. But my concern is, you know, if, if you put sidewalks everywhere, it might be fun to walk, but then what are we going to do when all the roads get flooded? Yeah. Um, what are so we gonna if do? we're concentrating on the downtown village area, um, maybe thoughts of bringing it up, and we've talked about this, you and I, so. Um, and I know there's always the the compromise again. How much money do you have? I, but where can we get grants to bring the sidewalk up so people can get on their bike and ride down and get a coffee and then come back and get a book? Definitely through this enrollment process and then looking at other grants of the future. <laughs> yeah, I'll t like bike and walkability is a big issue for a lot of communities and this grant is certainly an opportunity for funding those things like that. And to your point with the stormwater, we will get to that one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Really quick question yeah. about the biking. So like in my dream world, I can get on my bike and ride to Dover and ride back and I know that that's probably like a nightmare from many different perspectives, but is there any sort of inner, like, regional bike path type of plan that you've heard of? I have not. Um, to be fair, I don't do much work of, like, the, the main New Hampshire border relationship. Uh, the only one I'm really familiar with is the Eastern Trail, but as far as I know, that's ending in Kittery one day, right, Abby? Do you know anything about... Land. I'm not sure that it's being proposed to come up into yeah. Not at this point, but yeah. it, it comes pretty close. It's yeah. going to come down almost parallel to Route 4. So, like, Route 4 is, like, here. Oh. The Eastern Trail is going to come down to here. Mm -hmm. And there's probably potential to blaze a trail through to connect through. Because it comes right down to South Berwick. Yeah. But, again, that wouldn't cross the river, I don't think. That's okay. That's James, yeah. there had always been talk about having... A, a walking trail or maybe a biking trail from the downtown to here. Is that happening? So the Penny Pond, obviously you know, the Penny Pond Trail gets to Wilson Street. One of the challenges is the the Penny Pond Trail exit out, exits out to someone's driveway. And they've explicitly asked us not to use it. I think there's, and there's one that goes to Dobson, which probably could be mm -hmm. used. Um, we were just trying to figure out how to navigate another, the, the best entry onto Wilson Street. But well, the edge site has all, that's all would be connected through. So if you can figure out how to get, to, actually it's um, Logan Street. Um, but, but there was an issue about where the fire department is now. And, the, you know, of, of how did you get the trail across that? So there's, there's two ways. There, there's, there was a proposed path that made its way onto the, the fire department plan, but also 
you get on to Wilson Street, you could just walk down to the sidewalk on Sullivan Street, get down that way too. Now, are those or, bikeable too, or just walkable? Do you know? Most, well, okay. mostly. Oh, I think mostly walkable. It's not quite fully bikeable at this point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, moving on, and we'll have plenty of time to talk more about ideas after we get through what you're already doing. Then it's the time to talk about what you could be doing. Um, but these are great ideas to get started with. Um, so another area to point out is in the municipal operations, um, which is that, you know, the town of Burbank has tried to reduce their own energy use and their own cost of all the energy that they have to buy for the town uh, to keep operating. Um, so installing energy efficient lighting in the municipal buildings, LED street lights, and heat pumps in town hall as well. You also mentioned to me that the town is purchasing a solar farm subscription, right? That's done, yep. Oh, yep. Mm -hmm. we, all of our electric, well, most of our electric load is on a solar farm that was built in Berwick. Great, yeah. Yeah, so lots of those, you know, sort of low-hanging fruit um, electricity and energy-related options to reduce municipal energy use, um, which is great. Uh, this one is also, you know, not just the municipality, but the community as a whole has, you know, really focused on local food systems and food security. Um, in 2021, Berwick passed the Food Sovereignty Ordinance, which basically allows folks to sell the jam and honey and other products they make at their houses to, um, you know, other folks in the community. Um, more easily and then also you guys you know it seems to me as an outsider that you have a pretty lo thriving local food economy with the Burke Winter Farmers Market and lots of farms in the area and local producers um, which is really great you know because local food means less miles that the food travels to get to the consumer and also means your community is more resilient um, in that you're not relying uh, as heavily on food from far away if disruptions like the pandemic or other issues happen. Just a few more to go through. Here is water. So drinking water is really important for the health and safety of your community. And I know that James was telling me how there was a problem this summer with the manganese in the drinking water, driven in part by drought. Um, so if climate change causes droughts to be more likely, that could continue to be an issue. But the community is already doing a lot to do infrastructure upgrades to the drinking water system. Um, that's happening now, right? Yeah pilot testing right now doing testing to dial in the exact treatment um, levels and what needs to be put in to the system to, to treat their water so that's we'll have the results back in a couple months yeah that's great okay and then the last one here um, is stormwater so um, stormwater, as you mentioned, is a big issue for communities, especially with, you know, um, highly paved down east, downtown areas. Um, and as such, uh, Berwick, these are two photos that James sent me of floods in 2009, where you guys had um, floods that were, you know, really unlikely. A hundred year floods happened back to back in two consecutive years. So those floods were supposed to be happening once every hundred years and they happened twice in a row, which was really bad luck, but also, you know, uh, extreme precip precipitation events like this um, may be more likely under climate change, especially in southern Maine. Um, so Berwick's already doing a lot to address stormwater. Um, James mentioned that infrastructure adaptation fund project to do some stormwater adaptation. Um, and Berwick is also part of this group of Southern Maine communities um, called the Southern Maine Stormwater Working Group. And as part of that, they're adopting new permitting requirements for development, um, which Abby knows a lot about if people want to ask about it. Um, but it's going to require folks to incorporate a lot of more sustainable um, and nature-based solutions for stormwater called low impact development um, where you use nature-based solutions, you use plants, you use the soil, you use drainage to filter and channel that stormwater so that it doesn't cause flooding on your roads. So to get back to the concern about the sidewalks um, and the roads, you know there are ways to increase walkability and bikeability that balance um, 
the stormwater issue so that you don't increase stormwater. You use different um, swales or filtration to um, make sure that stormwater is being retained and that it doesn't flow uh, and cause flooding issues. Question? Mm -hmm. I, I just assume that the planning department, the, the planning uh, in terms of South Burke, uh, I mean, excuse me, Berwick, <laughs> uh, that <coughs> land, use, land use ordinances are up to date with uh, issues such as this, so that when if, if and when a de developer comes in and they usually want to lowball their costs, so they, you know, in terms of curbing, in terms of grading, in terms of roads, in terms of all those things, but if the land use ordinances are up to date by the planning uh, Group, then uh, some of this can be addressed. And I don't know if that's how that works. Either. Yeah, a, a, a ton of it, um, what you see is the like stormwater retention. Most of what the engineers do is all stormwater. Okay. So if they're creating impervious surface, especially if they're affecting wetlands, they have to create basically other wetlands or retention areas or man made biofilters that can treat the water. Sometimes it can improve the area and they become pretty sophisticated and engineered, but it becomes a, every development that comes in that has a, those features, they have to be inspected. So every subdivision that comes in that has stormwater features, town has to keep up on the, either homeowners associations or the developer or the landlord to make sure those are maintained forever. It's always a balance between, yeah. But it's pretty, it's pretty sophisticated stuff with um, the stormwater working group and the DEP permits. They're getting quite involved. <coughs> For example, I used to go out and inspect the uh, outfalls. So the stormwater goes in and then it gets piped out and it gets to the river and just kind of make a note. Does it smell? No. Is there color? No. With a new permit, we actually have to go and test it and becoming quite involved. And along with the permit, there's mandated land use ordinance amendments. So who does the testing, like code enforcement people? Or? Code, code or planning, yeah. It's a, it's a shared responsibility between code planning, town manager, planning board, select board. Great, thank you. All right, so that's sort of the end of the presentation. I'm sure there are other things that Berwick is doing and we can keep talking about those more as well. But now this is the point of the, the meeting where I, we're really interested to hear what your ideas are and what you think Berwick can do to address climate change. You know, we've already heard a few of those. Um, but the idea being that, you know, based on the feedback you guys give as well as you know, the work the municipality's already been doing, uh, SMPDC is going to help Berwick apply for one of those community action grants through the Community Resilience Partnership and or potentially some other grant programs that might be a better fit, you know, for something like infrastructure. Um, so, uh, I've done a lot of talking and you guys could probably use a break to think about this. Um, so if you guys want to take like five minutes, um, think about some ideas you have, get another cookie, please, a drink, um, and then we can come back together and finish up with a discussion. If you're looking for some ideas of potential projects on the back of your note sheet is a list of some project ideas. Um, and they're pretty general, but just to give you, you know, some jumping off points, they're grouped under different categories like transportation or buildings or healthy communities. Um, and then a few bulleted ideas and you can either tell us you really like one of those and how it could work in Berwick or something totally different. It's up to you. Um, but I'll gather us all back together in about five minutes or so. And I'm going to go get a drink. <laughs> We could all gather back together. Um, hopefully you guys had a nice break and a little brainstorming session. I know we over by the cookie table were talking about some good ideas of some things Berwick could be doing. Um, so this is the point where you guys just share what ideas are important to you and what you think the community would be doing and then we can talk about them a bit. Um, 
and see if there are any other good ones we can come up with. But no idea is a bad idea. And as tangentially related to climate change as you want it to be, that's OK, too. Um, so does anyone have an idea they're just bursting to share? We've sort of been chatting here about mm -hmm. um, householder responsibilities, you know. The frustrations, first of all, of everything coming in plastic and everything coming in a paper bag and the difficulty of recycling all of those things appropriately. Mm -hmm. But how can we be more careful about what containers we purchase things in? How can we maybe switch from paper towels, which I use all the time mm -hmm. to, you know, n not good, to old towels, old sheets that I tear up and, you know, can use and, and wash. I mean, those basic things mm -hmm. sound really silly, but they're so basic and they get one and it gets a family in the practice of thinking this way. So I think that those are sort of, you know, probably very obvious um, <laughs> steps that people can take mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, will maybe reduce the products that are so damaging. Um. Yeah, no, that's a really good point, you know, uh, to the point of that, you know, we're talking about what the community can do, but the community is made up of individuals who all make their own actions. So um, do you think there's any role that a community organization or the municipality itself could play in helping people learn about those steps or, you know, be reminded of those steps they can take? Yeah, James? The Lawn Chairs concert series was um, compostable. Everything was compostable. Mm -hmm. So the Envision Brewer was conscious about making it as close to zero waste as possible. Dude, um, at that event, did they sort of advertise it? Did they make a big deal of the fact that it was a zero waste event? Probably could have done more to highlighted because it was an undertaking that mm -hmm. they, they did. But. Yeah, when I worked at the University of Maine, they did the similar thing with a lot of their events. We tried to make them zero waste, but I felt like one of the most valuable things we did at those events was um, instead of people like just throwing their, their compostable stuff and their food waste into different bins, um, we actually had people like eco reps standing at each bin and would like show people where to dump all their stuff. And I felt like that was the most valuable because it was that education component. Like, you know, it's great the event's zero waste, but that is a small impact versus if folks actually learn something at the event, it has a broader impact that maybe they can take home with them. Um, any thoughts about this idea or any other ideas to share? Yes. Um, what I've heard uh, so far. To me, it all boils down to education. And uh, I'd like to see, as a retired educator myself, I would like to see, we, we have requirements for graduation at the high school for volunteering. Okay, there are certain, most high schools now have 40, 50 hours of, of uh, uh, volunteering in the community. What about uh, requiring or at least begin to have an elective course on um, environmental issues and tie that with economics in the sense of what does it cost to save our environment? What is, you know, in, in a broad sense, and what, the, what are the costs if we do nothing? And I think that our youth is our future, number one. They're the ones that are going to send the message to their friends and to people their age and their children, et cetera. Begin, to me, it begins with education. So I'd like to see a group of people from Berwick and North Berwick and Lebanon, well, they all share the same high school, Noble High School, approaching the school board with the idea of folk, uh, and get a grant. I bet you education grants are a lot easier than some others, <laughs> uh, to fund uh, a course. It could start as an elective, but it might, might uh, morph into a, a requirement course. If we, th if we think it's important, 
that our future is tied to education of the environment, this blue marble we're hurtling around the solar system on, then um, I think that, you know, there's, there should be some serious inquiries into our school boards uh, to talk about the education involved here. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, I'm hearing some nods of agreement. Anyone else want to build upon that or just say that they like that idea? I will do both. <laughs> okay. Um, I love that idea and what I had asked about earlier, you know, making sure that there is a pipeline from our high schools to training schools for kids for whom college is maybe not the right path, um, for them to be able to envision themselves and know that there's a role for them in the clean energy economy, I think is really important for them and probably for their parents as well to get on board with the whole idea of a clean energy economy. Um, so I don't, yeah, I know that the clean energy thing that the state's running was mentioned, but I don't know if we need to do anything else to make that happen. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I can definitely, it can be something we look into more of is that program going to be, do schools need to apply to participate? Are there going to be grants? How's it going to be set up? You know, but it's definitely a good idea. And the idea of just ensuring that the schools that represent Biddeford are a part of that movement towards that is, I think, really important. And what about a youth um, committee? Mm -hmm. climate change committee from the kids. I mean, we're using up their futures. Yeah, so are you talking about like um, uh, like a school group or are you talking about like a committee in the community that has youth representation? Uh, either way. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about, you know, Noble High School, if they have like a sustainability club or a green club or something what like that. I think they do, and they actually work it with their food service program. Yeah. Is, is trying to make sure that they don't have waste going out and that. And they also have been doing a lot with um, the community getting um, local farmers to donate food and, and buying locally so that they're not having people truck it so far. Um, but yes, I do believe there is a, a group up there that needs help this. I just think that, that if you go through the school board that, uh, and, and we could get it into a, a course that's offered, I bet this grant money, um, part of the easier grant money is through education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'm certainly not so familiar. I do know there was some legislation and funding passed last year in the state to do develop some climate change related curriculum so you know I don't know too to much me, about it. The connection is the economics mm -hmm. because uh, environmental change is impacting our pocketbooks we know that um, and so if we get a, a, a good base of education about things to do what, what can we do looking into the future um, what are the costs involved in that? But more importantly, what are the costs if we do nothing? Mm -hmm. And get people educated about that fact that if we do nothing, we may be paying more in the long run. Mm -hmm. It's like the old thing, you know, the, uh, I used to, when I was on the planning board of, in Salzburg, talk about roads and they, you know, the people want to be cheap, cheap roads. I can remember one councilman saying, how come we have plenty of money, excuse me, yeah, plenty of money to do something twice, but never enough money to do it right the first time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny how that works. It's education. Mm -hmm. I really liked the electric school bus idea, and I don't know, James, if that's already something that's being talked about or if it's something that specifically we need money for, but I'm... Um, I think going with just getting kids to education. Um, the electric school buses, um, partly from a visibility and a normalizing thing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also everything that's on here about, you know, and, and I don't know, too, you might be able to speak to this about building codes, specifically for town buildings, um, but also just in general. I don't know how much more there is that we can do to improve sustainability via building codes. 
Yeah, the electric school buses is a really great opportunity, you know, um, for school districts um, either that own their own buses or that work with a, a bus provider. You c the There's tons of federal money for those right now. Um, that's how Wells and Agunkwit got their grant, Waterboro got um, I guess it's a rebate, um, and the federal funding that's available for that is called the EPA Clean School Buses Program. You get a rebate that for com rural communities in Maine basically covers the entire cost of an electric school bus as well as funding for the charging infrastructure to charge that school bus. Um, so like you said, it's a, right now that's a very um, relatively easy first step that's also very visible and could have a big impact. Um, and then for um, the building codes, you know, that's a really hard one, balancing building codes and more energy efficient building codes with the cost of housing and whether you want more affordable housing in your community. Um, but that's certainly the way things are going um, with the, the state of Maine adopting, you know, Every year, there are, every other year, there are new building codes and the state of Maine adopts them and they're always more energy efficient. So I think for communities that are concerned about energy efficiency, um, being proactive about adopting those building codes early and smoothing their community into that transition of the more stringent energy requirements is only going to be beneficial because it, it's sort of that problem of you're getting there eventually and it's either you can get there eventually easily and less painfully and successfully or it can be really hard. Um, but certainly as a municipality, you have the ability to pass more stringent building codes for maybe just commercial development um, or also for residential. Um, but yeah, definitely a good idea. And um, Portland and South Portland have both adopted a more stringent building code for their communities. Grants just said that anybody who builds a new parking lot has to put solar panels over it, which I think is a great idea. Not that we have many large, you know, we don't really have large parking lots here in Berwick, but just like the concept of you know, not wanting to burden people who can't afford it, because I know that there are, you know, well, I mean, my partner and I can't afford to put solar on our house and we'd love to, um, but just, you know, looking for where we might be able to find money to do stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw that too. The parking lot solar is pretty cool and it can be combined as well with the EV charging stations, you know, so that a piece of land that's otherwise just sitting there is um, being used in its best way possible. Will there be a charging station in the edge? Um, I think they're open to it. I mean, I think we could facilitate a grant so it could get there with no cost. But I think it'd be up to us to push the issue or yeah. convince them. Either way. Sorry, where was that? The, the edge is the redevelopment. Oh, Are there any public EV charging stations in Berwick in any businesses or anything like that? I don't think so. No. Libraries? Definitely a good place, a place where people spend, you know, a couple hours so that their cars can charge up nicely. I think a comp composting, if you could fit it at the transfer station, that'd be cool. Yeah. Could be a big cost saver. Definitely, yeah, the amount that communities spend on solid waste disposal is probably a large part of your budget, right? Food waste is probably pretty heavy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So explain what a composting yeah. facility looks like. like it basically looks like a larger version of what you probably already have at the transfer station, which is like a big pile of yard debris and leaves and... Um, Basically, for a community the size of Berwick, if you were to do a food waste composting program at your transfer station, you would just have, um, they're called windrow bins, and you would have, you know, three or four large piles that you would have to employ or pay your, your transfer station staff to uh, maintain and rotate and turn. Um, 
But yeah, it just looks like piles and when done correctly, you know, doesn't smell particularly bad um, and can just start accepting both that yard waste and community food waste. Um, but there are also other options, you know, some communities have haulers pick up compost. Um, some communities work with local farmers to have the food waste delivered to the farms where the farmers already have compost systems. Um, so those are sort of the three main options. and. Um, there's actually a lot of support from the state DEP for communities interested in composting program to figure out what system would work best for them based on their community size, the amount of solid waste they're disposing of all the time. Um, so if that's something of interest to the community, there are lots of resources available for that. That's the project I'm working on with the town of Freiburg to try and figure out over the next few months. So soon I'll know more about it too. Um, but it's certainly a, a big issue for a lot of communities because it has such clear benefits, you know, environmentally of keeping that food out of the landfill, but also it's a cost saver for the communities spending less money on solid waste disposal. Have you heard of anyone in Maine using, by anyone, of course, I mean entire towns, um, like is the bioenergy, like methane capture from compost, is that, do we have the scale for that? Um, there's uh, one farm in Maine, AgriCycle Energy. Um, some of the communities have partnerships with them and with Eco Maine to take their waste. And so um, they're sort of, Yes, we do, but it's like one place that does it. And I think there's also a place in New Hampshire um, that some, like, some of the like, curbside composting companies take their waste to. Um, but yeah, it's hard to get it like, you know, dispersed throughout because it has such high regulations for environmental permitting versus like a compost heap is a lot less um, tedious, yeah. Any other project ideas folks want to just throw out there um, really quick or have any more comments on the project ideas we have brought up? Like um, we can go through them really quickly, <laughs> which is, you know, uh, helping individuals deal with household waste and individual issues, um, packaging um, and recycling. I can throw in another yeah. wonky comment. Um, in terms of zoning and just because the reality is like we can try to reduce as much as we can and if we continue to experience urban sprawl at the rate that southern maine is currently experiencing urban sprawl like it's honestly those effects will cancel each other out and we won't make any progress and um, i don't i know there was some discussion of zoning i personally don't know the zoning laws very well like i should know them better um but that is like as someone who has recently moved to the area and like recognizes that I'm part of the problem per se. Like, I don't know if that's something that the, the town has talked a lot about in terms of not losing. One of the one of the strategies is to encourage a vibrant farmer economy. We've identified through comprehensive planning and envision for work. The best way to protect farmland is to put it into use. So. There's like a five-prong approach to agriculture, including farming, farm-based products, agro-tourism. It'd be really impressive if I could do all five. I think education's one of them. There's a fifth one. But um, trying to get the like farmers like markets. Markets is one of them for sure. So getting the the local produce to actual markets and have. And, we're seeing that. I mean, Bad Wolf is incredible with what they have for local products. We have the farmer's market, like that was pointed out. That's just incredible. Um, but And the, the town has open space impact fees, so strategically going after what the most valuable or endangered land is, and actually the town go in and either partner with the land trust or go out outright buy it, and or, or partner. There's a few different ways to do it. Our zoning's pretty good. Um, it does protect against sprawl. It, it, it makes development in rural areas pretty difficult. There's a few things in place that really do protect it. There's always more that we can do. But it's just a matter of, like the issue that I just see is just a, in some instances, even with the, the protections we have, just a, like 
if there's, there's a house lot built on a real, real area of one every three years, 100 years from now, you're going to still see. So trying to figure out how you encourage an orderly development that protects land. So through planning board, like cluster developments is one of those strategies, things like that. Is there like a limit on how tall you can build downtown? Yep. I imagine there is. Yep. Yeah, it's, it's, it's four stories. It's four stories downtown, and then it's like, as you go out, it gets to three, two stories. All right, well, we are getting pretty close to 7 o'clock, so um, thank you guys all so much for coming and participating in this discussion. Um, like I said, the next step is for us to get Berwick enrolled in this partnership and then work with the town manager, James, and uh, to figure out what the priority, what project the town would like to apply for a grant for. And all the feedback you guys gave tonight and project ideas are certainly things that we'll look into and consider and explore farther. As follow up from this, we'll definitely send you all this list of ideas and any, you know, resources that have come up um, that we can connect you to that we weren't able to bring up tonight off the top of our heads. Um, but just thank you all, and if you have any other ideas as you're getting ready to go or because I've cut you off, feel free to come up and talk to us, and we can keep adding them to this list. Um, also on the back of your note sheet is my contact information, um, so please take that with you. Um, take the fact sheet with you, and if you have any other thoughts or questions now or in the future, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we here at Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission, while we technically usually work with municipalities, are happy to direct you all to the right direction whenever you have a question um, relating to sustainability or climate change. Um, so thank you all so much and please take more cookies and food to go.